Leibniz. Now we're up to a German. Tonight we're focusing on rationalists and those on the continent. On the continent is not just France, but also Holland we visited with Spinoza. Now we're in Germany, in mid-Germany, in the town of Leipzig. We find a gentleman named Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Leibniz lived from 1646 to 1716. The son of a professor of moral philosophy. Can you imagine having your dad who's a professor? What's he probably talking about at dinner? <laughs> He's probably got high academic expectations for his kids. And so the young Gottfried Wilhelm studied Greek and scholastic philosophy as a boy, studying all these authorities. Then he entered the university at age 15, where he found a better philosophy than scholastic philosophy. What was the better theology, excuse me, the better philosophy that he found? Francis Bacon, right? Hobbes, Descartes, Kepler, Galileo. All these things were to him much more exciting than anything he had heard from Thomas Aquinas. Earned his doctorate in law, turned down a professorship like Spinoza. Became a diplomat and was lit and later discovered or invented infinitesimal calculus. Interestingly, Pascal also had a role to play in the invention, the creation of calculus. What Leibniz is all about, though, is the idea of harmony. Imagine Leibniz being the, the, the peacemaker. Being a diplomat was probably well suited to him. He was, he was a peacemaker his whole entire life. We talked about the Reformation, all these people dividing into different... Christian churches and confessions, he was the one who's trying to bring them back together. He worked to try to reconcile the various Christian confessions, the various churches. He attempted to find common ground between Catholics and Protestants. Did it work to bring them back together? Not yet. Tried to reunite the Calvinists and the Lutherans. Did it work? Nope. Tried to unite the, the Christian princes of Europe to be able to create Christian, a union of Christian states. Did it work? No. But it does reflect this belief that he had in harmony of all of us living in harmony. So some of his idea, some of his ideas, Leibniz said, God wills what is most harmonious. So his philosophy is all about harmony. What does God want? God wants harmony, so whatever is most harmonious is what God wants. Does God want for the two of you to be fighting? No, God wants harmony. Whatever is most harmonious is what God wants. He said, nature is God's clock. We're going back to the deists, right? How does the God creates the clock, winds up the clock? He said, God pre-established the harmony of the universe in the beginning of things after which everything goes its own way in the phenomena of nature according to the laws of souls and bodies. God builds the clock, sets the rules, puts everything in order, and then lets it go according to the laws that God set. So the soul and the body, how does he explain the relationship between the soul and the body? He said, think about it, the clockmaker builds one clock and it ticks, builds another clock and it ticks, and you know what? They both tick together. Oh, body, soul, both ticking together. Your body and your soul tick together, both made by God, keeping perfect time without any need for repair or adjustment to make them synchronized. God makes your body and soul synchronized. They tick together. Leibniz also talked about the pre-established harmony being pre preferable to the occasionalists who assumed that God is constantly adjusting the clocks as a deus ex machina. <clears throat> deus ex machina is when God steps in and does things, so that, for instance, <clears throat> I will for my hand to move. God steps in, and what happens? My hand moves. So that's deus ex machina. God is stepping in to do things, right? I want to pick up the softball. Okay, that's my will. What happens? God steps in, boom, helps me to pick up the softball. I don't know how to do that myself. But when I will it, God steps in and, and makes me do it. That's deus ex machina. Had no place in Leibniz's view. Leibniz said, after making the world, God continues to maintain it. The world depends on God for its continued existence, but goes on without needing to be mended by God. God built the clock. 
It's good. It keeps ticking. God doesn't have to step in. There's no need for God to step in. If you need to pick up the softball, I don't know how you're doing it, but it's not, it's not God stepping in. Whatever laws are at work are the laws that God created at the beginning of the world. His argument for the existence of God, ooh, sit down for this one, this perfect harmony of so many substances which have no communication with each other can only come from one common cause. My body and my soul, they tick together. How do my body and soul tick together? Obviously, it was God who created that. Us, ticking to the same laws. Ooh, when you get hungry, you eat too. When you get tired, you go to sleep too. We all tick by the same laws. How does that happen? God is the clock maker. God coordinated the ticking, set the laws. So the fact that so many of us tick to the same laws, if you will, obviously that points to the clock maker argument. He said there is truth in all schools of philosophy. Can you see him trying to bring harmony to everyone now? We have more in common than that which separates us. There are truths in all schools of philosophy. You Catholics, you Protestants, you have more in common than that which will ever divide you. Can we come to see how it is that you, that you all have truth? You're all coming to some kernels of truth here? He said there's a fundamental distinction between truths of reason and truths of fact. Well, what's the difference between a truth of reason and a truth of fact? First of all, what's a truth? A truth is the correspondence of a proposition with reality. So if you say something and it corresponds with reality, then it's true. Father Jamie is wearing a brown jacket. Okay, don't know where that came from. But if what you said fits with reality, then it's true. Oh, Father Jamie's wearing a brown jacket. What you said fits with reality. It's true. That's what a truth is. So it fits with your perception of reality. Okay, so what's a truth of reason and what's a truth of fact? A truth of reason cannot be denied without being involved in a contradiction. So that, for instance, examples of a truth of reason, think about these things in your head. You cannot tell me that I'm wrong when I say A is A. Tell me I'm wrong. That's a truth of reason. That A is A is a truth of reason. Another one. A is not non-A. That was a little deeper, but you can't argue with me. A is not non-A. A is not something other than A. A is A. Other ones, um, he, re he referred to them as identicals because you're just repeating the same thing. You're not telling me anything new. So, that, for instance, when you say A is A, you're not telling me anything new. It's an identical. A is A. Another example, the equilateral rectangle is a rectangle. Hello, that's a tautology. You're saying the same thing in the beginning as in the end. That a rectangle is a rectangle? Or to say a rational animal is an animal. Okay, you didn't need to tell me that. Those are truths of reason. No one can, no one can prove me wrong. When you say a rational animal is an animal, prove me wrong on that one. Those are truths of reason. Another type of truth of reason is that are disparates. Disparates are truths of reasons that state that the object of one idea is not the object of another. So his example was heat is not the same thing as color. Oh, okay, I guess I can't argue with you on that. Can you argue with me on that? Heat is not the same as color. Can you argue with me? A dog is not a cat. Can you argue with me? So that's a truth of reason. A dog is not a cat. Truths of fact, though, are different insofar as the opposite is possible. Truths of fact are truths that are contingent, meaning not necessarily so. So that, for instance, Leibniz said that God exists and that all right angles are equal, 90 degrees, are necessary truths, but it is a contingent truth that I exist or that there are bodies which show an actual right angle. So there are certain things that we can think in our mind like right angles, but to actually think that a right angle exists, that would be a contingent truth or a truth of fact rather than a truth of reason. Truth of reason is what's in my mind. Truth of fact is 
whether that corresponds with reality. Leibniz said to state that God is possible is to state that God exists. Because in the sentence, God exists, think about those two words, God exists, the predicate exists is contained in the subject, God. By saying God, that very word implies that God exists. You don't have to say exists. When you say God, <coughs> God exists. Unicorns. When you say unicorns, got news for you. Unicorns exist. What do you mean they exist? Even if only as an idea, <coughs> unicorns exist. Tell me I'm wrong. They exist as, a, as an idea in your mind. Oh, uh, uh, what's a unicorn? That's a horse with a horn on its head. Oh, you have the idea of a unicorn. It exists. The notion of God is the notion of a supremely perfect being. Existen existence is a perfection. And so therefore, existence is comprised in the notion of God. Because God is being, and being is perfect. God is. God is the necessary being, the being that necessarily exists. It is impossible to speak of a merely possible, of a merely possible necessary being. Can a necessary being, God, be merely possible? No. A necessary being must be necessary. Follow me? I feel that's a little deep. Can a necessary being be possible? No. A necessary being is necessary. God is the necessary being, God is necessary, God is. <coughs> so assuming that God is possible, Leibniz said, God exists, which is the privilege of divinity alone. Only divinity has that privilege of existing uh, independent of other realities. Immanuel Kant would later object to this, saying that existence cannot be predicated of a subject. You can't say that something exists. That <coughs> Kant is going to come up with arguments. Save that for two more classes. We'll come back to that. But Leibniz then essentially saying activity is essential, is an essential character of substance. A substance cannot exist without action. God cannot exist without doing something. We cannot exist without some action, without doing something. Everything that exists is something, does something. That was pretty deep. <laughs> Where we're going with all this is tonight then was on the rationalists over on the continent, France, Holland, Germany. These people are starting from one conception, thinking through God and all these ideas not based on anything that we see in this world, but just thinking through God. When we come back, next class then, we shift to England, where the emphasis is not on being up in our heads, closing our eyes and thinking. It's about opening our eyes and seeing what we observe, and hearing, and tasting, and touching, and feeling, taking in things from our senses, and figuring out what knowledge we can get from the senses, rather than from the mind and from reason. Tonight, Rationalists and reason. Next week, empiricists and the senses and the sense experience.